All right, good morning, everybody. Let's go ahead and get started today. Welcome to class on this Friday. It's, uh, I'm glad it's a Friday. I'm sure you guys are, too. Might be another hot day out there, I guess. We'll see. Uh, a few quick announcements. Just remember that homework, number one, is due next week. <clears throat> Depending on when your recitation is, that might be Wednesday. Uh, I guess that's all Thursday for all you guys. I keep forgetting you're all the same section or uh, day. Uh, so just uh, check Carmen for the actual assignment, the, for the actual questions. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, the actual problems are in the, at the end of each chapter. So um, go to the end of each chapter and you should be able to find, find those questions there. Uh, I I'm, I'm apologize. A few of you have emailed me with questions about problems you're having accessing FLIP. The, the video recordings, and I'm, I have not responded to your emails yet, and I apologize. I will do that later today. Um, and as you guys might notice, those of you who are here a few minutes earlier, as I, I like to play a little music before class gets going, if, uh, and I'd ha be happy to take requests. So if any of you have a song you like or something, feel free to email it to me or email me the name or something, and I can, uh, we can play that before class. Uh, any questions before we get going on uh, homework or how are things going? Okay, great. Um, we're going to uh, continue with chapter two today. I think we should finish it up pretty quick and then move on to some chapter three material. So uh, it's a little preview of what's coming. And just to refresh your memories, that uh, when we for chapter one of this class, we were talking about graphical summaries. So we looked at uh, ways of displaying data so you can look at it visually. Uh, we talked about pie charts, uh, histograms, some of those kind of things. <clears throat> And in chapter two, we introduced some ways to um, objectively assess our, the numerical summaries about our data. So we talked about measures of center, which was the mean and the median. Uh, we talked about spread briefly, which was the interquartile range. Talked about how to find, find that. And uh, also involving the IQR, we talked about a rule for how to detect outliers. Before, we'd kind of just been saying, oh, this point looks like it might be an outlier, hard to say. Um, and so there was a rule that we had for actually saying, yes, this point is an outlier, no, it's not. Uh, so we're going to finish up one other measure of spread today, and uh, I think that's about, about all the rest that's in Chapter 2, and um, talk about using technology briefly, and then move on to Chapter 3. So the, uh, again, one way we talked about to measure spread was the, was the interquartile range. Uh, the other way that we have, we have, again, two ways to do this, sort of like measuring center. We have the mean and the median. Uh, over here on spread, we have the interquartile range as well as the standard deviation. Um, and what we're going to use for the standard deviation is uh, this lowercase s. It's going to be our notation for the standard deviation. Um, and uh, it's used to describe spread, so just like, uh, just like the interquartile range. And then just a note there that, like the mean, it is not resistant to skew or outliers. And we'll, I'll show you a few things about that in, in a little bit here. Um, and then to calculate the standard deviation, again, we have a formula for that. If you have the notes, it should be there in front of you. It's on the next slide. But to get to the standard deviation, we first calculate uh, something called the variance, which is the standard deviation squared, or s squared. Um, which you can see there is the average of the squared deviations of the observations from their mean. So again, remember when we were talking about the mean, we were calling that x bar. It was x1 plus x2. This is our notation plus up to xn, and we divided that by n. We also wrote this out as 1 over n times the sum from i equals 1 to n of xi. So the xi are just our individual observations. And so for an observation xi has deviation, you just subtract off the mean. So how far away from the overall mean is it? That's what I mean when I say a deviation. And uh, so then the formula that we have to calculate the variance is listed up here. Um, it's good to know what this is and, and uh, maybe be able to recognize that, but we're not going to actually ask you to do this by hand very often. So we're going to be using technology, so don't, um, if that looks a little intimidating, don't, don't worry about it too much. Um, but again, we're taking, the, we're taking the deviations. So here's the deviation. Again, we're just subtracting off the mean. We're going to square it, and then we're going to add them up, and then we're going to take the average of those. Um, and then the, the standard deviation is simply the square root of that, of that number, the positive square root. So again, here's the formula. We're not going to ask you to do this by hand very many times, but that's, that's what the actual <laughs> formula is. And maybe, so, so if you 
again, going back here, we said this was the, the variance was the average of the squares of the deviations. Um, so if you notice, we're dividing by, we're taking 1 over n minus 1 instead of 1 over n, which we did previously. Um, and just a, little, just a little technical note, the number n minus 1 is called the degrees of freedom. Um, and the reason that we divide by n, uh, 1 over n minus 1, multiply times 1 over n minus 1 instead of 1 over n, there's some theoretical reasons that we don't really need to worry about too much in this class. Um, but just note that that number is called the degrees of freedom. And we'll see that again, we'll see that again later in the course. So um, again, no need to worry about that too much at this point. Um, just kind of showing you some, some formulas here. So let's, uh, let's practice, let's practice uh, kind of going through a little bit of what, what we, how we would calculate the variance and the standard deviation. Um, <clears throat> we're going to go back to the, the uh, same example we were working with on Friday, looking at the, um, the heights of the players on the Chicago Bulls roster, roster from last year. Um, and so most, most of the things I've already filled in here, but um, this first column, this is our actual, this is our actual uh, data here. So for each person, we have, we've recorded their height. So the first guy is 77 inches tall and, and so forth. Um, in the next column there, I've listed the mean. So that's the, uh, the overall mean that I've calculated. We did that, we calculated that on Friday as well. Um, this deviation column here, this is going to be the xi minus x bar. So I'm simply taking the first column minus the second column to figure out what the deviation is. So this is uh, 77 minus... 78.4, and I'm out of room there, aren't I? <laughs> Let me, well, so I'm just going to subtract the, the, the second column from the first one, and that gives us a negative 1.4. Same, same for the second row there. I can also subtract the second column from the first column, so take 81 minus uh, 78.4. And that's going to give me a 2.6, and then so on. So I, I'm not going to make us go through that whole, the whole song and dance there. But for each, for each observation, you see that you could calculate the deviation from the mean. And then in the final column, we're going to square those. So we're going to take um, one, negative 1 1.4 squared, which gives us 1.96, and 2.6 squared, which gives us 6.76. So I'm just taking... I'm just taking the deviation and I'm and I'm squaring it. Um, and then if we look back at our if we look back at our, back at our formula here real quick, now that I, I calculate the deviations, I square them. Now I need to add them all up and then and then divide by by something. So if I if I put a little plus sign here and I'm adding up this entire column here, um, the sum there that I get is 195.08. Inches squared, and my units are squared because I've squared the the uh, the height there. So that's a little a little weird to think about, maybe. So then my degrees of freedom. Um, which I'm going to say call that d f. This is n minus one, so that's thirteen minus one, which is twelve. Um, so my variance, again, just going back to that formula we had, um, we wanted to take 1 over n minus 1 times uh, this 195 that we just added up, which is 1 over 12 times 195.08, which is 16.26 inches squared. So you see that this is kind of a tedious calculation. So this, this is why we're not actually making you do this all the time. Um, we're almost there though, so we've we found our variance. Now we just need to take the square root of that. So now the standard deviation which is what we're really interested in is equal to s, which is the square root of s squared and that's going to give us a 4.03 inches. So there is calculating the standard deviation. There is our final answer. <clears throat>
So again, remembering that I'm just, what I, my first step was to calculate how far away each observation is from the mean. So that's kind of the, that's where we're getting at the idea of spread. So looking at how far, so if we, we calculate our overall mean, we're seeing kind of how far our observations are away from that. Um, and we're doing some, some calculations, adding all that up and sort of averaging that, that, that distance is kind of how you can think about it. And lots of lots of math on this on this page. Any any questions on what we're doing here or why we're doing this or very quiet today. Yeah. Great question. So the question was, uh, it seems kind of counterintuitive to if if we're gonna take a square root eventually, why do we square everything, then add them up, then then take the square root? Great question. And that would be this. That would be this point right here. So, um, if you want to check that here, you're welcome to do that. But if you add up, if you add up this column here, that will add up to zero. So if we if we were to, I mean, so yeah. So we can't add them up. Uh, I mean, it'll always equal zero. So great question. Um, we're sort of doing something and then we're undoing it, but it kind of gives us a, a measure there of what's what what the difference is. Yeah. Good question. Any other questions? Yeah. And I guess along with that, is that, is that a good like, check system that we can check and see if our deviation and reservation are right because they always equal zero? Absolutely, yeah. So is that a way that you can, if you're calculating all these deviations, is that a good way to check what we're doing? Absolutely, yeah. That will always, um, this, this point will always be true, uh, that the deviations will always add up to zero. Maybe if there's some rounding, it might not be you know, exactly, exactly zero. But yeah, if you're calculating the deviations for your data set, um, you can double check it to make sure you've done it correctly. Yep. All right. So that's that's uh, that's how we actually calculate standard deviation. Uh, like I said, most of the time we'll be using technology to find that number. Just want to walk through the calculation one time to kind of show you what we're show you what we're talking about here. So let's talk about some some properties here of the standard deviation. Um, so again, we have two measures of center. Uh, two measures of center. We have the mean and the median, and this is kind of uh, the IQR and the and the standard deviations are sort of the the um, the, the parallel of that. So uh, S measures spread about the mean and should be only only be used when when we're talking about the mean. So so S the standard deviation and the mean X bar go t go together, just like the uh, median and the interquartile range go together. Um, so only use the standard deviation as a measure of center when you're also using the mean. Um, the standard deviation will always be positive. So remember, we're talking about a measure of spread. So uh, you wouldn't expect a, a group of numbers to have a negative spread, right? Again, we're we're squaring, we're we're adding up a bunch of squared things, which are all going to be positive. So this will always be always be positive. So again, if you are calculating the standard deviation and you somehow end up with something negative, then you've made a mistake in your calculation. Another another little check there. Um, but then yes, S is measuring spread. So so as as the standard deviation gets bigger, um, that means that we have that we have more spread. Um, and as the standard deviation gets smaller, we might have that, that indicates that we have a less spread in our data. And it is possible that th that the standard deviation is ac is actually equal to zero. So that happens sort of um, rarely. That will happen when when uh, all observations have the same value. So that's sort of a trivial case. Doesn't really happen very often. Um, and then a few other notes. Uh, the standard deviation has the same units as the original measurements. So, so back here in our, in this example, note that the standard deviation is in inches down there at the bottom. And again, our original data was in inches as well. And finally, like the mean, it's not it's not resistant to outliers and skewness. So, um, same idea that we saw in the mean, and that every number in our data set goes into calculating the mean, right? Unlike the median, where we were just counting things, and so some extreme values might not have too much of an effect. Same here for the standard deviation. Every observation is being used to calculate calculate this. So, um, yeah, like like the mean, it will not have it will not be resistant to outliers and, and skewness. So uh, again, if we were to run through the calculation again, remember uh, in this data set we have. Nate Robinson, who's one of the shorter players in the NBA, sort of an unusual height for him. If we took if we took his height out, the standard deviation drops down to three inches, 3.01 inches. Um, so we go from having a spread of four point what was it zero three I guess, um, 
and that drops down by an inch. So, so there's a there's a just a example that when we take out sort of an extreme value, our, our standard deviation changes a lot. It gets a lot smaller. <clears throat> Any, any final questions about the, uh, the standard deviation here or what, what we're doing here with this or these properties? Okay. Well, again, technology is going to be our friend here, so, um, and, and you guys should go over this in recitation, uh, how, to, how to get these, these numbers out of, out of jump. Um, down here, I made just a, a brief note of, of what you need to do to get this to get this display here that I'm showing you. Um, and actually, just with with one with just one click, you can just do this thing once, and it will give you all this information. And note note that we have here: we have the mean, we have the standard deviation, um, we have the quartiles and the median here. We have our our minimum. Sorry, I should say. So here's here's the. Uh, the third quartile is right there. The first quartile is there. The median is is there. And then we also have a we also have a picture of the histogram, so we can look at the data. The uh, the box plot, remember there that that's that's hanging out there as well. Um, the box plot gives us a visual of the five number summary. Uh, remember that's the minimum, the maximum, and then the quartiles and the median. So so just kind of quickly, you can get all this all this information that we. That we need, that we've been talking about very quickly. Technology will be our will be our friend here. And so, all that work that we did to calculate all these things, uh, we're not going to worry about that as as much. And then, just to show that we can also do the same thing if we if we take away Nate Robinson's um, obs uh, observation from the data set, note that our standard deviation goes down to the 3.01 that we just mentioned, and we have all that all the other information there as well. So that, that's, that's uh, again, going through, if you guys know how to make a histogram in, in Jump, then I think you already know how to get all this information. Um, but just uh, there's, again, a quick instruction on, on how to do that. So I think that's the end of Chapter 2. Or let's um, move on to Chapter 3 here. Any, any final questions that you guys can think of before we, before we uh, move along, push on? No? <laughs> OK. Well, yeah. So, if you have your if you have your chapter three notes, do you want to go ahead and flip over to those? Oh, well, this is one more thing I wanted to say quick. Um, so, to see if you were paying attention here. Uh, so, um, when we're when we're choosing a measure of center and spread, sorry, I need to tack this on quick. Uh, like I said, the standard deviation goes with the mean, the median, and the and the interquartile range go together. Um, and the five number summary is usually better than the standard deviation and mean when we have a skewed distribution. Or something with outliers, and uh, then we want to use the mean and the standard deviation when we when we have sort of a symmetric distribution going on that doesn't have lots of crazy outliers. So, poll question here: which is which? Which one should we use for the bull's data? Do we want to use the five number summary, which is includes the median and the the IQR, or do we want to use the mean? How many think we should want to go A with the five number summary? I'm seeing a lot of hands. How many B want to go with the mean and standard deviation? So a few hands as well. Um, so what, what the first paragraph says there is, uh, this question comes down to, is there, is there skewness or outliers going on here? I guess we, we found that there were not any outliers officially using our, using our rule. But looking at, um, looking at this histogram here, we kind, of have, we kind of have that type of a shape going on. It's kind of a, a little bit of a skew there. Who can tell me which direction the skew is? Left, exactly right. So uh, this is a, it is a slightly skewed distribution. So um, the the mean and standard deviation would not be the worst thing you could do, but but I would say if we're talking about which one is better, I'm going to go with the five number summary because we do have some skew showing up here in our in our data set. So very good. Um, all right. So I think I think that is is that officially my all right. So uh, here we go with chapter three. Um, titled the normal distributions. So, again, um, just kind of summarizing what we've done so far in chapters one and two, we've made a display. We've looked for an overall pattern. So we talked about, um, remember back to chapter one, we talked about shape, center, spread, and outliers. That was kind of um, talking about an overall pattern for our data. And then we also calculated some numerical things. 
Um, but another step can sometimes happen, and, and that's that uh, sometimes the overall pattern of, a, of our distribution or our histogram is, is regular so that we can describe it by a smooth curve. Um, and pulling up two histograms from the chapter one and two notes, uh, I just wanted to point out that we've already sort of done this. This is what I encourage you to do when, we're, when you're describing a distribution. I think it's helpful to always sort of draw a smooth curve so, again, you can kind of see the overall pattern. So we did something like we drew a little, little curve like this. For the height data, we had this bimodal thing going on here. So we did something like that, um, just very roughly using, using a, a smooth line to kind of look at, to see the overall pattern a little, a little easier maybe. Um, but now we're going we're gonna to talk about doing that a little more formally. So if my histogram, if my histogram looks something like I have there on the left, um, I can, over there on the right, I can draw a smooth curve to it that will give me a sort of a better image of what the, what the distribution looks like. And what that's called is called a density curve. Um, so the definition there at the top, the density curve simply describes the overall pattern of the distribution. So again, using a smooth line to kind of see that overall, that overall pattern is kind of what we're going for here. And uh, just, a, just a few properties about density curves. Um, uh, by definition, they, they have to always be positive. So it has to be on the horizontal axis or, or above. And you can see that from, from right here. You see the lowest number that I have is a zero. So it's always, it's always on the axis or above it. Um, and then the area, if you could calculate the area beneath that curve, it will always add up to one. So uh, how many of you guys have had calculus before? Oh, wow, most of you. Very good. So uh, integration, you know how to take, calculate an integral, right? So we're not going to get into any of that here. You can breathe easy, I guess. But uh, if you could imagine calculating the area underneath this curve, this would, this would add up to, to one. So if you were somehow able to, uh, to, to do that for this curve, you would find that the integral over that, over that, and under that curve is, adds up to 1. So again, two properties. This always has to be positive, and it's going to add up to 1 underneath the, the curve. And then uh, the key idea here, which we'll, we'll look at here in an example, is that uh, the area under the curve and between some range of values corresponds to the proportion of the population that falls in that range. Um, so I'll show you. I'll show you what I mean mean by that. But uh, maybe going back to our picture, let's get a different color here. If I wanted to pick out, you know, between between five and ten, if I shade in the area under the curve, uh, that area will will correspond to the proportion of people in my population that are between five and ten. So um, again, since it adds up to one, we can kind of think of that as as a percentage. Um, and we'll, I'll, I'll show you what I'm, more what I mean here in just a second. So, so again, to kind of motivate this, uh, let's, let's start with a simple example. Um, here I have a picture of a density curve. Uh, so it's, it's, uh, it's not a curve, it's just a straight line. Um, but so if I, sort of like in that other picture, my density curve is there, and then it drops down and is zero elsewhere. So again, it's not a curve here, more of a, more of a box. Um, but this, this blue line here, that is a density curve. So let's, let's think about the example that we have going here. So, um, and this is out of your textbook from chapter three. Um, if we examine the location of accidents on a five mile bike path, um, we find that they occur uniformly. So they kind of occur at the same rate across the, uh, over the, the distance of the bike path. Um, so what this what this y what this y axis here is this is the um, this is the proportion of accidents. That's what we have over here. And that I guess I shouldn't cover that up. That is at a height of one one fifth. Um, so, so here's our density curve that describes the distribution of accidents on this bike trail. That's what we're looking at here. Um, and again, since it occurs uniformly, it's just going to be a, a flat line. So first question here, if we have a, you can imagine that there's a stream alongside this bike path between um, the 0.8 mile mark and the 1.3 mile mark. Um, the question we want to know is what proportion of the accidents happen on the bike path alongside the stream? So going back to um, 
Remember, the key idea here is that the, the area between two values corresponds to the proportion of, of uh, things that fall between, between those two numbers. Um, so we want to know the proportion of accidents that happen here between, imagine that being 0 0.8 and uh, 1.3. We want to know the proportion of accidents that fall between between 0.8 and 1.3. And so to do that, we just need to calculate the area under the curve that corresponds to that um, between those two numbers. So here we have an easy case because it's just a rectangle we're trying to find the area of. Um, and so we can just use some geometry and uh, figure out what that, what that value is. So maybe I'll just sketch this again real quick. So this is at a height of one fifth, and we're between 0.8 and 1.3. We want to know what this what this area is. Um, who who can help me remember the formula for a for a rectangle? Length times width, right? All right. <laughs> we don't have to pretend like we're still in high school, right? So this this area this is the this area is the proportion that we want. So this equals the length times the width. And here, um, you can do it either way you want here, but the, the width we'll say is, well, we'll say the length is one, one fifth, so one fifth times, and then the width is just 1.3 minus 0 0.8. Um, so this is 0 0.2 times 0.5, and that answer is 0.1. So again, just the, remembering that the area corresponds to the proportion of accidents. So this, this here is our, this is our proportion. Proportions of accidents between um, 0.8 and 1.3. Mile marker 0.8 and 1.3. Is that okay so far? Is that kind of, see what we're doing here? Again, we're starting out pretty, pretty, pretty simple here. <clears throat> uh, maybe a slightly, slightly um, more difficult question here. So suppose that uh, at each end of this bike path we have um, a road at each end. And so if we want to know what proportion of accidents happen more than one mile from each road, uh, we want to figure out what proportion that is. So um, when we're looking at these pictures, uh, these questions, for me it always helps to draw a picture. I, I, I think that's always a good thing to do. Just jot it down in your own 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 sheet just to kind of see what we're talking about. So let me draw this again. This is my density curve from zero up to five. And this, this height here is one fifth. Um, so, so, and let's, let's just fill this in. One, two, three, four. So where, where do I want to shade here if I'm talking about uh, the proportion of accidents that happen more than one mile from either road? So, so we have a road we have a road here, and we have a road here. The roads are at either end of the bike, bike path. What, what area do I want to shade, shade in here? Between the one and the four. Between the one and the four, all right. So I want to go, go one mile away from, from this road at zero, and I want to come one mile back from this road at, at five, and this, this area here. That will be the, the um, part of the bike, co bike trail that corresponds to being more than one mile from, from a trail. So very good. Um, so now, again, I want a proportion, so that's corresponding to area. Again, um, this is one-fifth times uh, four and one. So four minus one, one-fifth times three. And that just gives me a three-fifths or 0 0.6. And again, that's my proportion of accidents that happen um, in between those between those mile markers. So I just had a I just had a question come in. Why does the area of the curve always add to one with gathered data? Won't it be won't it maybe be different? Uh, great question. So, um, well, maybe let, I'll let you guys finish jotting this down. All right, so let's let's jump back here to a hist to our histogram real quick. This picture that I drew. Let me 
clear this off here. Uh, so, so most, so what we've done when making histograms so far is, is over here on this, on this axis here, we've displayed the the count. Is what we've done so far, right? So between each little in each little bin, we've counted up the numbers that fall between that, and we've made a our bar that tall, right? So. Um, Let's go maybe back here. So again, for this bool's data, again, if we're, if we're in this range, we count up that there are one, two, three people in between, in between that range. That's what we're doing with the histogram. So the one way we can do is we can, count, we can list on the, on the axis the count, the number of people that fall in those range. Um, the other thing that we can do, uh, which is what I've done here, is not list the count, but list the, if you can read that, it says density. So what I've done is I've taken instead of listing the the counts there, I've listed the, like the the frequency. So I've divided each each column by the total number of people in my observation. So now, so now between in this bar, this is um, however many that is. Um, I've divided that. It's that percentage of the whole uh, percentage of all my observations in there. Um, so what that curve will give me then is is something that has exactly area one one beneath it because I'm listing the the frequency. Or the density in between each thing instead of the counts. Um, so let me know if that didn't answer the question. Uh, maybe a follow-up came in. Do we always want to answer uh, with decimals for the proportions? Um, so I guess maybe maybe this is not quite the question, but uh, so when you're when you're giving a proportion here, it should always be between zero and one, right? Um, so we're finding some area beneath the curve, so it should always be a decimal or a fraction. Um, and then if you want to use a decimal or a fraction, like here, use 3 fifths or 0.6, uh, whichever one is, is fine. Whichever one you prefer is, is okay. So did that answer the question and or are there other questions on what I'm doing here? Okay. So again, the main, the main idea here is that the, if we're talking about a proportion of something, uh, we want to find the area. That's kind of the, the, the parallel we're drawing here. So just keep, keep that in mind as we, as we move forward. So like, like when we were looking at histograms, we can, we can also um, do some des descriptions of density curves here. Uh, and we can use kind of the same ideas. We're talking about the center and the spread and the, um, to, to describe a density curve. But for density curve, we won't be talking about outliers. So you can kind of scratch that for, for talking about density curves. Um, the median of a density curve is the point that divides the area in half. Again, remember the median means that half the numbers are smaller, half the numbers are larger. Um, so it divides the area under the curve in half. And the mean is, uh, as we've mentioned before, is the balancing point. So if you imagine that density curve as a solid shape, the mean will be where, where that thing would balance if you put it on uh, a, a scale or something like that. So to give you an idea of what we're looking at here, um, here I have a picture of a of a symmetric curve. We've looked at this before, and here's a skewed curve. Um, and again, we we've seen this before. So again, for a symmetric curve, the the median is going to have half the area on either side. So that's right here in the middle. But since it's symmetric, that's also going to be the balancing point. So those are going to be the same thing for a symmetric uh, density curve. And then who can help me out on the, on the right here? Um, let's, let's start with, with this one. Is this going to be the mean or the median? The mean, right. Very good. Because the mean, the mean always kind of goes out into the tail. You can think about that. It's influenced by the larger values. And then this is going to be our median. So uh, we've looked at these these little pictures before, I guess, but uh, just kind of now realize that we are talking about a, dens a density curve, and so we can kind of do the same descriptions uh, if we want to. Um, but just a, just a quick note here that when we talk about a density curve, uh, we're, we're talking about its mean, we're talking about its standard deviation, um, but we want to we want to differentiate between the mean and standard deviation of the density curve and the mean of the and the standard deviation of a data set. So something we actually calculate. Um, so for a density curve, we're going to use we're going to use this symbol here. If you guys are familiar with Greek, that's the that's the letter mu. So this is pronounced well. You can see it there. 
pronounced mu. That's, go, that's what we're going to use for our, uh, the mean of the density curve. Um, and then we'll denote the uh, standard deviation, this, this uh, lowercase sigma. And that's what we're going to use for our density curve, mean and standard deviation. Um, real quick, what are, we, what, are, what are the symbols that we use for our data set? What do we use for the mean? X bar, thank you. And for the, the standard deviation, we use S, right. So um, just to quick make a note of that, for, for a density curve, we're going to use um, mu and sigma. And for the data set, we're going to use X bar and S. So this will become more of an issue later, but just to, uh, just to kind of introduce that, that this is what our notation is going to be for density curve versus um, versus our data set, or what we actually calculate. All right, so most of what we're going to talk about, the, t the title of the chapter gives this one away, I guess. But um, uh, the density curve we're going to spend the most time talking about is, is something called the normal distribution, or you could call it the, nor the normal density curves. So this is a specific family of density curves. And there's a picture of what they look like down there in the corner. It's kind of this, uh, well, so it's the, all, all normal curves that are in this family will have, have the same overall shape. So they're going to be symmetric, unimodal, and kind of have that bell shape that you've probably seen before. And then if we want to, if we want to des describe what, what, a, what normal distribution we're looking at, all we need to do is give its mean and standard deviation. So we just need to say, what its, what its mean is, what mu is, and what sigma is. And then our notation here, which we'll use a lot, is um, a capital N with a mu and a sigma in parentheses. And that will mean here that we have a normal distribution with mean, mu, and standard deviation. That's what this notation will mean. Um, so again, this will be, be a little more clear, I think, when we look at an example in just a second here. Um, but again, the point is that when we're talking about a normal distribution, they all have the same, the same sort of general shape that's bell-shaped bell and symmetric and all, all of these, these good things that we talked about. So here's just an example of what, of some, so I, I'm talking about a family of density curves here, right? So this is some different normal curves. Some of them are more squished together. Some of them are more spread apart. Um, and remember, they all have... As a density curve, they all have the same area underneath them. So the ones that are more squished in are going to be taller. The ones that are more spread out are going to be a little shorter. Um, but these are just example of some different different density, different normal normal curves here. So just kind of show you show you exactly what I'm what I'm talking about here. Uh, a few more a few more properties to n mention here is that the mean is is located at the center and it's the same as the median. And that's, again, because it's symmetric, right? So we have a symmetric distribution. So the mean and the median are going to be exactly the same. Um, and so if we change the mean but don't change the standard deviation, that's, that corresponds to sort of to shifting, shifting the curve back and forth along the y-axis. Um, so again, these, none of these are the same. But you can imagine that I've, if you can imagine I pick up this green curve and I move it over a few units, I could get something that's Something like that. That's just shifting it over. Um, by the way, you're going to see me drawing lots of normal curves in this class, and I'm going to butcher it every time. So just prepare yourself. It's it's fun. <laughs> um, so that's what I mean by a shift. Just you can imagine picking up picking up one of those one of those curves and moving it around. That's just I'm changing the mean. So the mean again, if we're talking about this green this green one here. The mean is right right there at negative five. Um, but then if I, so I can also change the standard deviation. If I, if I make the standard deviation bigger or smaller, I'm, I'm making the distribution more spread out or less spread out. And so that's a, a rescaling or a stretching. Um, so if you compare, if you compare this, this green one with this red one, um, they've also been shifted. But notice that the red one is a lot more squished in. So I've kind of, I've kind of squished it in, or the green one is, is more stretched out than the, than the red one is. Um, so that, that's kind of what the, again, the mean, the mean, remember, is right here at the middle of these curves. So for the green and the red, the mean is right there in the middle. And then the standard deviation corresponds to how, how squished in or how spread out it is.
Any any questions on what I mean by that? The rescaling and the the shifting. Again, what are, what are we even talking about this for? Yes. Yeah, so let's let's get on let's get on to that. Um, so maybe maybe another example here, kind of like that former picture. If we have three normal curves here, um, let me label these here. I think they're labeled in your notes. This one is A. Uh, this one is B. And this one is C. So hopefully you have that in your notes in front of you there. And um, I'm going to ask you a quick question here. So which of the following statements is true? So is, is curve B, am I shifting and rescaling A? And then C is rescaling A? Um, and then there's a number of other, other choices there. So I'll, do you guys have notes here that you can see the picture and look at this slide? Some of you, maybe? So I'll, I'll let you read through the choices, and then we'll, we'll, uh, I'll ask you to raise your hand and, and vote for, for which one you like. So again, remember, a shift just corresponds to the same, the same shape, but you're moving it around. And a rescaling um, means it's more or less squished in or, or spread out. All right, so I'm going to I'm going to flip back over just so we can look at the picture one more time. And then and then let's look at our look at our choices. So, how many of you think that choice A is correct that normal curve B is a shift and rescale of curve A, normal curve C is a rescale of A? Anybody want to go for that one? Nobody. How about uh, how about choice B, normal curve B is a shift of curve A, normal curve C is a shift and rescale of A? Anybody like that one? No. How about choice C? Normal curve B is a rescale of curve A. Normal curve C is a shift and rescale of A. So seeing a lot of hands there. And anybody want to go with D? Normal curve B is a shift and rescale of A. C is a shift of A. Anybody? Wow. Well, you guys, I guess we had complete consensus and you are all correct. So choice, choice C is correct. So just note that um, what C says is that B rescales curve A. So again, notice that they have... B and A have the same, the same center. So again, I haven't going from A to B. I haven't, I haven't done any shifting. I've just, I've just squished it in, and then to go from B to C, normal curve C. I'm both uh, rescaling it. So I'm, I, it, you can see C has the same shape as B, but then I'm just moving it over. So very good. You guys all got that one exactly correct. Uh, maybe one other question. Uh, suppose that these are normal curves we're looking at, which which they are. Um, so which 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 of these statements is true? Does normal curve A have a, a mean 70 and standard deviation 2? Curve C has a mean 80 and standard deviation 5? And so on. I'll let you read those quick and see if you can um, pick out the correct choice. And just maybe a note that the, you, looking at the picture, you can't actually see what you cannot actually see what the standard deviation is. But um, just remember what the standard deviation represents. All right, how many? I'm not going to read through. I'm not going to read them all out. But how many think A is correct? Anybody want to go with A? Anybody want to go with B? Seeing a hand or two. Anybody for C? And anybody for D? Seeing a number of hands there as well. All right, so let's go back and let's go back and look at the picture here and see if we can see which one is correct. All right, so let's first let's talk about um, let's first let's talk about curve A. So curve A. Uh, what what is the mean for curve A? I've sort of drawn it in there. Well, again, we pick out that point that's right in the middle, so its mean is going to be 70. Whereas curve C. Um, again, I pick out the point that's right here in the middle, and I can see that I've bumped that up to. Um, so let me actually use our notation. The mean is mu is 70. Over here, the mean is 80. Um, 
So right away we can we can eliminate a few of those choices. We can see that they have different means. Um, so we want to go with the ones that have uh, curve A has mean 70, curve C has mean 80. So that's good. Well, they don't have the same mean, so this one's this one's out. This one's also out. So kind of choosing between A or D. Um, so then so then we have a choice between standard deviation of 10 and standard deviation of 5. Um, which uh, which is curve A? Does curve A have the bigger standard deviation or the smaller standard deviation? It has the, the bigger standard deviation, right? Because it's more more spread out. So this uh, this standard deviation uh, sigma is going to be bigger than than curve C. So over here, indeed, we do have sigma equal ten and sigma equal five over here for curve C. So I think that corresponds to choice D. And this is our this is our correct answer. So very good. Most majority ru rules again here. That's good. Um, any any questions here on what uh, what we're looking at? On what if you if you um, if you're not convinced that I've chosen the right ones here? All right. Well, a few more a few more properties to talk about. And then I promise at some point here we are going to get to an example uh, in just a, about two slides. We'll show you exactly what all this is, is, is for. Uh, so one, one final rule that we have that we're going to talk about a little bit here is this rule that's called the 68.95.99.7 rule. And you might ask, where did those numbers come from? Why am I choosing these three numbers? Um, and the, this corresponds to um, a certain proportion of area under the normal curve. So Again, if we're if we're talking about try my normal curve here. If my if my mean is right here, then I have 68% of my observations fall within one standard deviation. 95% um, falls within two, and 99.7 falls per, falls within three standard deviations of of mu. So rather than try to draw this whole picture, I'll just show this thing here. I hope you can see. All right. So again. If our if this is this is our mean right here, if we go one standard deviation on either side, we're in that that dark blue shaded area. That's sixty eight percent of the area under the curve. Um, if I go out to the plus or minus two there, that's two standard deviations. I have ninety five percent is in that range, and if I go out three, I have almost all or ninety nine point seven percent of the data. So remember again, remember going back to that sort of simple example we started with. Uh, Remember that the proportion under the curve corresponds to area. Um, and when we were in sort of that simple case where we just had a rectangle, it was very easy to calculate those areas. Um, the actual formula for, for, this, for what this, this normal density curve is is fairly complicated. And it's actually impossible to integrate directly. So um, if you were to think about doing the same way, it's, it's sort of not possible to very easily calculate, by hand anyway, an area under this curve. So kind of we'll, we'll get we'll get to that a little bit more but um, we're, we're going to use this rule for starters here so as you go as you go further away from the mean you get more and more of the area under the curve and um, one two and three corresponds to 68 95 99 point seven percent all right so let's uh, let's start looking at an example here and um, and okay, just another reminder there of our notation. It's going to be different for the for the population or the density curve, and it's going to be different for this sample. So mu and sigma versus x bar and s. We've kind of already already hit on that. All right. So finally, finally, an example here. We uh, we're going to look here at the little brown bat. So this is one of uh, I don't know if you know, but there are 13 bat species that live in Ohio. I'm sure everybody loves bats, right? Um, and uh, some background information on this, there, uh, there's been a decline in this population, which is possibly due to, uh, to some disease. Um, and we're just going to look at, a, look at the distribution of wingspans. So we're saying the distribution of wingspans of the little brown bat is approximately normal with mean 25 centimeters and standard deviation 0.83 centimeters. So again, you can imagine that we've collected lots, we've um, found lots of bats, found how big their wingspan are, uh, maybe made a histogram or something. And we found that it sort of had this, sort of had this this bell, this bell-shaped curve, um, where the mean here is uh, 25 centimeters, 
and then the standard deviation is, is 0.83. So that's an assumption we're making for now, and we'll, um, we'll, go, with, we'll go with that for now. All right, so first question here, what range of wingspans covers 95% of this distribution? So we can use our, use our rule here since we're interested in 95%. Um, so let me, draw, let me draw my picture here. Same picture I just drew. So it's centered here at 25. And I want to know what, what this number is here and what this number is here, uh, such, that, such that this is 95% of the area under the curve. So assuming that we have a normal distribution here with that with the mean and standard deviation that we, that we said, um, what are those two numbers that, I, that I've listed there? Almost, yes. So, so, so let's, let's calculate this out. So remember, the, the 95 rule says that um, so we have approximately 95% of all, op oops, all observations are within two standard deviations of mu. Yeah, so almost there. So, so what we have is, um, so this number, so this is, this is our mean mu, and this number here will be, will be mu minus two standard deviations, and this number will be mu plus two standard deviations. That's kind of what this rule is saying. So if you want to actually calculate that mu minus two sigma, that's a bad sigma. Uh, this is again 25 minus 2 times uh, the standard deviation is 0.83. Uh, so that's 25 minus 1.66. And that is uh, 23.34 centimeters. So that's the lower number. And then mu plus 2 sigma is simply mu plus 25 plus 2 times 0.83, uh, which is going to be 26.66 centimeters. So using the rule that we have, um, assuming that the distribution is a normal distribution, about 95% of these bats will fall between those two wingspan. They'll have a wingspan between 23.34 centimeters and 26.66 centimeters. One more question. Let's, let's maybe finish up here quickly. So what, what percent of little brown bats have a wingspan of less than 24.17 centimeters? Um, so to think about answering this question, first thing to do, at least for my brain anyway, is always draw a picture. That, that helps me anyway. So again, I'm going to draw my distribution in here, uh, centered here at 25. And I want to know what percent, OK, good. Uh, I want to know what percent of little brown bats have a wingspan less than, let's just say that's 24.17. So I want to know what proportion of bats fall down. What, what is that number is what I'm trying to figure out. Well, uh, so this is sort of manufactured, but again, we have 25 minus 24.17. That's 0.83. So this this distance right here is is one standard deviation below the mean. Uh, so we know that if we go one standard deviation on either side, so if we go between there and up here to 25.83, let me change colors quick. We know that this is uh, this is 68 percent. And so, what can you tell me? What can you tell me about the the, the blue shaded in area and the green shaded in area? How how do those compare to each other? <coughs> and pretend my picture is is better. <laughs> pretend my drawing is better. They're the same, right? So why are they the same? <coughs> right. Yes, exactly. So we have a symmetric curve, and uh, the, they start the same distance away from the mean. So if we take the, uh, um, let's do this. If we take the, the, the blue shaded in plus the green shaded in, uh, this will equal everything under the curve that's, that's outside that 68%. <laughs> so that's going to be um, 1 minus 0.68. 
which is 0.32. So those areas together give us 32% or 0.32. And then uh, if we want just one of those, that's going to be dividing that in half. So then um, let's go back to blue. So in the blue area is uh, 0 0.32 divided by 2, because those, those two areas are the same. So this is going to give us um, 0.16, or we could say 16%. So the question is, what percent of little brown bats have a wingspan less than 24.13 centimeters? And the answer is about 16%. Uh, questions on what, what I've done here, or is this making sense for now? <coughs> okay, well, we'll take this a little further, um, but uh, that's a good stopping spot for today. Have a great weekend, you guys. We'll, uh, we'll see you on Wednesday. And go Bucks. <laughs>